Ladies and gentlemen, it's Weather Brains. This is episode number 360 for the 17th of December, almost at Christmas time. This is the live video YouTube version, and we're delighted that you're here. If you're a noob, uh, if you want to watch the actual produced show, uh, move that slider about 13 minutes in, and you'll hit it right on the nose. This is the pre-show, which, Brian, I think features some very intellectual discussions at times, don't you? No. <laughs> Thanks for your honesty. The one thing about Brian, the man is honest. I tried to do my part for honesty. Um, all right. And we got... The, the 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 light that used to sit out there by my door, Bill Castle gave me a replacement bulb, and uh -oh. it's not as bright. But it looks. And good. I had to move it. I had to move it in, so now it's like almost in my face, and I can't see the uh, monitor that well up there. Wow! Oh. So I make an effort uh, to monitor things. The lighting's uh, good though. Oh hardly yeah, have lighting. A, hardly have a shadow behind you. Yeah, lighting is uh, very nice. It's it's a little softer than the other one, but you have to bring it kind of close. Um, all right, what what you eating there, man? The, the chat room wants to know what are you eating. Uh, the Boy Scouts just came with my popcorn that I ordered back. I don't know, two weeks, three weeks ago. Ah, I I guess I should uh, put go to mute, huh? <laughs> no, we love to hear that uh, smacking noise of. Food. So, uh, so do we have two guests tonight, or just one? I think we have two. I know that Jay Trebek is going to be with us from South Dakota, and somebody else from like the uh, University of uh, Michigan. Uh, Michigan State, uh, somewhere up there. Yeah, Michigan State University, MSU. I thought for a minute it was Mississippi State. I'm uh, hey, uh, trying to I expand this full screen so I can monitor this. I have an iPad question for you. Okay. My iPad would not do AirPlay. It would do AirPlay in photos, but it wouldn't do it in Safari. Any ideas? Really? Yeah. I even um, looked up the instructions. Heaven forbid a guy should read instructions. Really? Uh, that, that should never have to happen to anybody. Um, I, uh, I've never had that problem. I mean, you know, I use it at home, and mm -hmm. I use it here, and I just click that little button, well, you double. Yeah, there was no button. There's, there's no AirPlay button on Safari. And I even I even restarted when, the iPad. When you say Safari, what do you mean? Uh, the browser. Like I, I AirPlay it and mirror it, so you can just see everything on the Apple TV. Like like you double click, you know, and the little deal comes up with all the icons you're using. And yeah. You swipe it off to the right, and you'll see the uh, volume control and the start and the stop, and the little AirPlay button is right there. Oh, okay. And, and if you click that and then click on Mirror, then everything you see on Safari will be on your Apple TV. Ah, okay. Well, the instructions so I, indicated that you would find an AirPlay button in Safari. So, obviously... Not. I haven't read the instructions either. <laughs> well, apparently the instructions don't work. Because <laughs> I went to no. Photos, and the little AirPlay button was right there. I tapped on it, and boom, I was up. But then when you go out of Photos, the AirPlay stops. So, I will, I will try that. I have always just turned it on for yeah. everything, just mirror. And, uh, well, and I looked in settings, but I, I didn't see anything relative to AirPlay there. So I, I know where you're talking about now, so I will be looking at that the next time. As, as a matter of fact, I'm probably going to be over there tomorrow. So uh, so so now we got a tornado outbreak Christmas uh this is great, man. I thought you said we we're going to have an ice storm. Well, I figured it would be an ice storm. 
It's going to be a tornado wonderful. outbreak and then an ice storm. Oh, fabulous. That'll be wonderful. Now, you ought to look at the uh, the European and the GFS are in very good agreement. The timing's a little different, but somewhere Christmas Day to the next day, uh, oh, thank it you. looks like a significant tornado outbreak. And then it turns bitterly cold. And it also looks like a, a snow deal Christmas Day for like Tulsa and uh, Kansas City and maybe even a few snowflakes in Dallas if this verifies. So, wow. Uh, I think the Christmas storm will be getting a lot of buzz. Of course, you know, the, this Thursday storm, that's going to be a huge snow from Kansas to Wisconsin. Yeah, it was looking like that might be uh, up that blizzard, way. Blizzard warnings in a, a blizzard, a blizzard watch for uh, western Kansas. Already, huh? Mm. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, all right, let's go through the absentees. Um, we are missing tonight. JB, right? He just sent a note that um, he is uh, horse his voice, you know, horse, and Judy sick. And um, uh, who else is out tonight? Um, maybe just JB. Oh, J uh, producer JP is out. He is sick. Oh no! Uh, he's going to edit the show, but he—he's his voice is not good, and he's sick, and so he will not be on the show. So JB and JP are out. Uh, and by the way, we're doing a Thursday night special this week. We are. Uh, yes, our Christmas week episode will be recorded this Thursday night. Okay. We will release it to the wild uh, next Monday, uh, like. Christmas Eve, uh, but since uh, I am off, we're going to take it, uh, record it Thursday night, and uh, be a little different. We're going to start it at eight o'clock, and we have some uh, people coming in here, uh, some guests. We're going to set up a little weather brain set. So I, I've got to figure this out between now and Thursday, and I'm not going to have time to do that because we are about to start the Toys for Tuts extravaganza. Yeah, so I'll be lot. Do you need any help with that? If I do, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, well, I know. Don't you uh, access it uh, from out in the field now? Yes. Uh, okay. We use uh, an iPad app called Team Viewer that uh, lets you hook up to the WSI box. So I, I th and it's very reliable. So can I get that app? In, yeah, it's free. Oh, it's te okay. Team Viewer. Team Viewer. Okay. And I'll give you the. Password. And I could just give it out here over the air, so the whole world can, you know, sure. hack ooh, ooh, in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Nate, Nate will hack <laughs> in. I want to push it. James's buttons live He'll, on TV. He will so, really, really run that live shot very well. When are we going to do the uh, New Year's Eve? Because I noticed Monday nights a New Year's Eve, so I didn't figure we would be doing weather brains on New Year's Eve. The only no. losers would do weather brain shows on New Year's Eve, uh, uh, unless we all get drunken. <laughs> Sounds like my money. I'm about to say, there's our show title. Let's see, we always get the show titles uh, before the uh, show starts. Let's all get drunk and blank. Wow, um, that, that Thursday system's looking. I was looking speaking, at. Uh, speaking of which, that reminds me of a really good uh, Jimmy Buffett song. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm not going there. I'm just. <laughs> I'll blow the buzzer on that one. <laughs> like the, the long buzzer. Oh, God. <laughs> loud noises loud noises I, I like it when 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 uh ron burgundy is fighting that woman you know and she's beating him with those uh that, that tv antenna and, and brick starts going ah! <laughs> he just starts <laughs> oh my gosh holy <clears throat> mackerel holy moly oh my gosh not only am I going to have to work Christmas Day, I'm going to have a huge storm. So, so have you heard anything, James, about the schedule? Uh oh, he's locked up. Oh no! Nate, you come on, and everything goes down the tubes. It goes straight to hell in a handbasket. Yep. Story well, of my this? life. Okay, there's James Double now. Ne ne never yell in the microphone like that. It didn't like that, boy. Now we haven't had this. You, I we started you double for a. We haven't days. had this problem, right? In, in over two weeks, uh, I screamed oh, wow. in the microphone, and that's what happened. 
All right, let me bring in these guests. Um, They're all in the um, Yeah, thank you for doing guests. that. You were uh, very no kind. Actually, I think I'll stop by. Yes, great. Oh, my gosh. It's Ooh. bad. I'm telling you, man, and look at the snow in the cold sector of that thing. Um, Holy mackerel. You got this big runner going for you. Oh, geez, no. the 540 line is down into the Northwest Gulf. On the GFS or the European? No, this is the European. Yeah, yeah, that's... What was that Channel 5 logo I just saw? Oh, I'm trying How to... How did you do that? I'm, I'm in the toolbox here, and I'm trying to oh, get yeah. the thingy to... Oh, yeah. He's playing. Yeah, he's there playing. There it is. Before hey, you know, we'll have the, we'll have the right fart noises on here next. Um uh oh, Jay has no video. We see a freeze frame. <clears throat> now Jay worked this morning. Granted, he was at Lik the gym. Likely story. So, <laughs> have you heard from Kevin? He always shows up at the last. He'll come on here at eight thirty on the nose. Kevin Sellis. Yeah. Now, who's the other gentleman? Uh, Bob Drost. Bob, that's right. Bingo. Is yeah, Bill and, not going to be with us tonight? No. No Bill, he's, no JB. Yeah, That's right. Bill Murray. He, he I, I spoke with him by phone, and I think he's closing his deal out there. So, uh, Hey, Jay, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. I'm just, I just plugged in my camera. Okay. You should see yeah, we, me shortly. You see like this freeze frame of you being interviewed by somebody. Who's, who's, who's doing the <laughs> interviews? Is that Barbara, Barbara Walters or what? Uh, Actually, that that's on uh, that was on Russian television. On uh, that's a clip from Russian TV newscast back in June. Ruski, the Ruskis yes. want to Moscow. interview. Yeah, I can't. I can't do that. But Brian, did you ever watch uh, Bullwinkle? Of course. Boris and Natasha. Yeah, yes. Boris. Boris and Natasha. I, I, Leo Laporte does the greatest. Oh, uh, I bet he does. Russian. Um. Dasvidanya. Hey, Bob, can, can you hear us okay? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Boy, somebody's rustling around there. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, can yes. you hear us? Yeah, when I, when I put my headphones in, it mutes my uh, microphone. Well, that's a little odd. So. Um. You can go into the settings up there and check check your uh, audio source. Let's see. And pick the one you like. Man, we got a lot of people watching this. Uh, we are at record numbers on the uh, viewership here for this early in the evening. Uh, we're going to start the official show here in mo moments. We have Kevin Selly on the line. Hey, what's going on over there? That's a nice tie. Who always does the profile shot? I had I to. Know, I, like, um, I like that shot. I had to move it around because the camera that I'm using, the the, the computers are all behind the set, and it's <clears> sort of a reach issue. So this was the least objectionable. By the way, thank you for my Christmas card. You're very welcome. By the you way, know, uh, our buddy buddy Mike. Uh, Mike Cox says that James should use that particular Jimmy Buffett tune we were talking about for the song of the night after. <laughs> oh, boy. There you go. Yeah. Uh, you guys hear me okay now? Yeah, yes. Okay. Cool. Um, let's see. We're, once we get Jay's... Um, Video. There he is. All right. There I am. I, uh, hey. I had Skype on in the background, so it uh, I had fighting fighting applications here. <laughs> so okay. it's your, are you at your house or at the station? Because if that's a station office, that's pretty swank. <laughs> I'm just in the lobby, Nate. <laughs> hey, that's still pretty. My swank. office is in the garage. <laughs> Yeah, all the they finally, you know, they've they've read on our lobby and it actually, you know, it's still very classic Ron Burgundy esque where they've got pictures of all the main talent and everything, but it actually looks really nice the way they've the hallway sort of you walk in through the secure area 
and then you come through the door and you go one way to go to the newsroom and the other way to go to engineering and master control and the the engineering master control area is the really swank looking area so that's where all the main talent all the awards are if you go down the old school hallway there's a bunch of it's a brick wall and then they've hung all of us b c d and in my case z listers uh, on the side of the wall there um, and when so there's they, no there's no cool pictures. It's just you know no sexy yeah. weather porn behind you. Just pictures of Z list talent. <laughs> well, th this is uh, we actually have this is a time series of the life cycle of a supercell, and I'm in our main lobby. So that is you know, we're, that's we're, freaking we're weather, awesome. Weather is what that here. is. God, <laughs> I don't want to work at Kello. <laughs> All right, let's start this party. Into South Dakota. <laughs> let's start this party. Uh, again, let, let, let's see. Bob, just being sure, you can hear us, right? I can hear you fine. Okay, great. And, uh, again, just a reminder, you know the deal. If you got anything to type or, uh, you know, whatever, just be sure and mute uh, the audio. And uh, we got, we've got we got a nice compliment on the audio of the show because we've been practicing good muting here uh, on this show. Safe muting. <laughs> yeah, safe <laughs> muting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! All right, uh, here we go. And oh, I gotta click one more uh, button here. All right, record. Nice. All right, here we go. In five, four, three, two, one. Weather brains. Time now, ladies and gentlemen, for the weather weenies of the world to gather. This is Weather Brains, the weekly show. All about weather. This is episode number 360. And this might be the last show ever because the world ends Friday. Uh, yay! Kind of oh, I mean. Yeah. What do you mean, yay? I'm you sorry. I was, uh, end, you want the show to end? I, I didn't really think that was out loud. That was my mistake. <laughs> Kevin, are you okay? Ke Kevin Selly had this mysterious message once again. Although it was a very well produced message. <laughs> that you were out. So, do you want to share your the fact where you were last week? You were a wall. Uh, was I was off again. Family uh, had a chance to be with my family, and as I uh, mentioned, the uh, what was it two weeks ago when I was off? Is I like them better than you guys, and so I <laughs> opted to be with them. I, I want to get the number of your agent, okay? See, most of us yeah. schmucks that work television, we work nights, and and if we're lucky. If we're lucky, we get three. Three weeks off a year, if we're lucky. You know, three know. nights, three weather brain sessions, and yeah. uh, Kevin. Every other week, he's like off. I know so this who, year, who, I, I, I think I'd rather be paid, but uh, I'm, I'm, I've been here so long. I'm up to five weeks now. Wow. Yeah. How, I, I've worked here for three hundred years, and I get three weeks. I know. Uh, I know. No, 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 no. You only take I, three weeks. Yeah. I'm going to get that agent's number from from Mr. Sellis, and I'm going to call him. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm excited, man. You you got some weather happening out there. Uh, is it going to snow in Dallas on Christmas Day? I want you to break that news to our audience right now. Boy, I know it. You know, I was talking to somebody here at the station about this, and, and I don't know. I guess I'm just going to sound cranky again. But it, you know, I I understand. Yeah, big surprise, right? It's nice to be able to look seven days out, ten days out, whatever it is, but the unintended consequence or the net effect always seems to be that, unfortunately, it gives many people, including a lot of media outlets, the opportunity to just gin up a panic because it, it, it keeps people invested in turning on the TV, and, and, and I hate when that happens, but we'll see. It's certainly, you know, there's certainly that suggestion of some wintry precipitation, maybe I-20 corridor northward in Texas on, uh, on Christmas Day, so we'll see what happens. I saw a stat go by over the weekend. Somebody posted, I don't know if it's true or not. Brian, you should know this maybe better than me. Um, Somebody said that, that so far, Dallas is ahead of Chicago on snow. I don't think that, so. That, no, that, that's correct. I've the seen reporting? that. Uh, yeah, really? I don't know if that was right or not. See, Dallas has had more snow than uh, Chicago so far this right. cold well, weather season. Officially, yeah. I, I don't know. You know, stuff goes by now. We get into this, like the Sandy was in, you know, we get these fake pictures, and, you know, it's kind of tough to tell what's real anymore. I didn't research it, but I suppose I could while we're, while we're doing that. So how much snow have you had in the Dallas-Fort Dallas Worth area? We just had a trace um, uh, a couple days ago. Well, that's about all Chicago had. So I, yeah. I, I want to nail him down. He, he's doing this TV weather talk. Well, it's uh, too early to be specific. Is yeah. it going to snow in, in, at your house on Christmas morning? That's what I want to know. Not Christmas morning. No, I think it looks later to me. Um, 
I'll go with no at my house. I'm south of Interstate 20. And so in the metro, in the, in, in the viewing area, possibly. But in my house, no. How about, uh, ooh, how about McKinney? Will it snow there? See, I like to pin guys down. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I want to be specific. Uh, well, you're yes the one that no. you 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 tell me you're the one that forecasts for the whole country. Well, you have a station in Brownsville and uh, East Overshoe, Idaho. You, and you 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 are our DFW expert. Yeah. I'm going to say no, McKinney. Okay, so you got to What do you got to go to the what Red River or something or what? I mean, uh, you know, as I said, did I mention I have five weeks of vacation, meaning that I've been here a long time. <laughs> um, you, you, you know, you just, there's gotta be, if you don't have the cold air in place around here, which in this case it is, you gotta have a pretty big chunk of energy or a test pattern from an Indian, which Nate is showing right now. <laughs> I don't know if he doesn't want to answer the questions or what, but, um, you got, you gotta have a pretty good chunk of energy and wrap around is tough down here too. So the odds are statistically, I, it's in, in my mind, the odds are against it, but. It's certainly uh, certainly there as a possibility. How, how's that for the for Dodgers? There you go. And, and we have some people on this show that should have a white Christmas. We'll get to them in just a minute. But uh, let's bring in Brian Peters. Brian is the internationally beloved meteorologist who will be working Christmas week. And it looks like it, while, while Kevin is dealing with a snowstorm, you'll be dealing with a tornado outbreak on Christmas no. Day. <laughs> actually, the actually day. I'm starting to write my resignation right now. If the models <laughs> are going the way they're going, I'm going to quit before Christmas Day. <laughs> You know, that is an issue. Everybody's thin-staffed at Christmas, and, and, you know, you get a big uh, tornado outbreak or a big winter storm, it's a problem. I mean, yeah. getting the staff in here. So uh, Yeah. Uh, well, and I told you. When did I tell you? I told Mr. Spann about a week ago that I'm predicting a major event the week of Christmas to New Year's because he's going to be off. Highly technical <laughs> meteorological yeah. reasoning. Yeah, there you go. And it's the man is brilliant. So Brian um, is the reason that all the media outlets are panicking. Is that what we're saying? Exactly. Yeah, He's okay. the guy that started it. And, and by the way, Brian Brian has been bragging on his new computer, this blazing fast computer that boots up in two seconds. What you no, got? A new it, iMac? It, Yes, it oh. takes about 15 seconds, but that's okay. He's got one of those newly designed iMacs that's real thin, you know. I mean, it mm -hmm. looks cool. Mm -hmm. Mine boots up in six seconds, and my Ooh. computer is four and a half years old. Ooh. There's a, Ooh. There's a title in there somewhere, <laughs> Mine Boots Up in Six, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've already had a lot of show titles. We always get the show titles early here, but uh, Nate Johnson is at WRAL Television in Raleigh, North Carolina. What well, what are you drinking, Nate? Uh, ah, I'm I'm glad you asked. This what, is what, what, I I didn't recognize this. This is cheer wine. It is a it's originally from North Carolina. It was started in Salisbury, which is over near Charlotte. They've been bottling this mess since 1917. Uh, born in the South, raised in a glass, as the uh, slogan says. And it's a it's a cherry soft drink. It it's not cherry coke. It's not big red, but it's a it's a cherry soda or a cherry uh, soft drink, and um, I find that it's uh, it's good in all occasions. It, it goes with everything. Boozing it up on words. weather brains already. That's right. Yeah. That's right. For, for, it's, it's not a cold. That thing's beer. You know he's drinking booze yeah, or something is, up there. Yeah. Actually, a funny thing. I'm not a beer guy. I, I skipped straight over beer and went straight to scotch. But uh, <laughs> there's no there's no wine scotch, in this. Scotch, scotch, scotchy scotch. scotch. There you go. <laughs> but um, no, there's no uh, no alcohol in this. It's just a straight up uh, straight up soft drink like, that is very tasty. It's sort of story. my, you know, JB has uh, his Buffalo Rock and I have my cheer wine. So. Is oh, that a Cracker oh, Barrel oh. thing? They got all those things at Cracker Barrel. Is that no, one this Cracker? Is a, you can get this at Walmart. You can buy There's this a bunch of, bunch of old-timey ones, or at least old-timey sounding ones at Cracker Barrel, along with yeah. Stewart's Orange and Cream Soda, which we which we designated a lot of time on this program, too, some, some yeah. time ago. Yeah, we're we're going to send an invoice to those people for, for product placement on <laughs> yeah. this show here. But, uh, Nate, we've got some very important people, and you know the deal. And let me just say we have some absentees tonight. Uh, J.B. Elliott. The world's greatest weather man. He is ill this evening. He's very hoarse, and uh, his wife Judy is sick. JP, the producer, is sick tonight, and he's out, although he's going to stay up all night and edit. He just couldn't come on the show. His voice is bad. And Bill Murray <laughs> but is But you're going to uh, make doing... him edit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, come on. He's young. You know, <laughs> sick, that's not an excuse. Uh, and I, tr the truth is, I forgot how to do it. So, uh, 
<laughs> and and uh, uh, Bill Murray is conducting some business. Uh, he actually does have a real job away from this, and he is uh, out of town on business. So uh, what you see here on this show is what you get. And also, let me welcome everybody watching on our digital weather channel and our local market here on cable systems uh, around uh, our state, uh, James Span 24-7. If you're tuning in, expecting to see weather, you're getting some raw weather tonight. This is as hardcore as it gets. <laughs> and, Nate, on that note, I'm going to give it over to you and let you introduce our guests. All right. Uh, first off, we'll introduce our guest, Weather Brain, Jay Trobeck is from Kello Television, K-E-L-O, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Started as a sports guy and then <laughs> turned into a news guy and is now a weather guy with a Ph.D. So he knows his stuff. Uh, he is, uh, he's got his certified broadcast meteorologist uh, designation. He's also a certified consulting meteorologist. He speaks eight languages and tours the globe on a regular basis. Please welcome Dr. Jay Trobeck, Ph.D., DFA, M.D. Yeah. Welcome. Wow. Well, thanks, Nate. Boy, I hope I can live up to that. <laughs> I don't think that'll be a problem. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got from sports to news to Kello. Uh, well, if you can't do a job well, I guess they find something else for you to do. And that's <laughs> kind of how it happened, actually. <laughs> uh, it came down for me, it came down to if you want to have a job, you have to do this. And so that's how I got into weather. Nice. And uh, you've, you've really picked it up. I mean, it's not like you've done it halfway. Well, you and I have known each other a long time, so you know that uh, if you're not getting smarter, you're getting stupider, and uh, I think uh, we both yeah. figured that out. And uh, Unfortunately, we're both now teaching. Aren't yeah. We? <laughs> unfortunately for everybody else. Right. And we're teaching the young minds of the future. So um, tell us a little bit about, you do a lot of international. the EMS, the European Meteorological Society, and I've been doing that for years and uh, just getting around to the meetings and things like that. Uh, boy, <laughs> I've been to a lot of places, I guess, and uh, uh, know how to order a beer in at least eight countries. <laughs> nice. Uh, tell us uh, one thing, if, if there's anything that the European weather community could teach us, what could they teach us? I mean, I'm sure there's a oh. lot, but if you could narrow it down to like one big thing, what's one thing that they're just going, you guys have got it all wrong and here's how you need to do it? Well, I would I would say um, I saw some things involving uh, uh, satellite routines uh, this year when I was over in Croatia in June and saw some of the clever things they were doing with uh, uh, their satellites that, you know, they, they get the updates quicker than we do. And just using sensors, some unbelievable techniques. I, I think everybody in the room was really impressed by what they're able to do. I think they've got they think they got that one down. Of course, you know the size of the United States and the size of Europe. They can you know they can narrow things down and uh, and uh, use a lot of their uh, their imagery better than we can. They don't have to worry about as broad a space. But uh, mm -hmm. I saw some unbelievable techniques that uh, just uh, amazed me. Cool. Uh, do you have any lines that so we have a lot of, you know, really advanced weather forecasters who watch and listen to the program? Do you have a line on getting the European model data cheaper than uh, it's going <laughs> everywhere else? Well, knowing as many people as I know in the U.S., I know there are ways because uh, <laughs> I, I know some people getting some backdoor stuff. But actually, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I was really interested in this storm and uh, I actually uh, emailed a colleague of mine over at uh, uh, the French Meteorological uh, Agency and uh, it had, an, uh, it had a map emailed to me because I wanted to see what the year was doing. Uh, um, it's not quite that bad anymore, yep. but uh, certainly, yeah, they, they've, got, they've got a lock on that, uh, that data. And unfortunately, it's really good data, yes. especially when you're talking about, uh, you know, the medium range forecast. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, we appreciate you being here. And, of course, uh, you're intimately involved with our guest for tonight. You've done a research project that you presented at NWA. And... Uh
is aware of that, but uh, now I'll be ready for anything. <laughs> All right, sounds good. All right, our uh, our guest for tonight is Bob Drost. He's a graduate student in the Department of Geological Sciences at Michigan State University. I uh, started in 2009. His background is in environmental science, but he's a, he's a weather nut and a climate nut like most of the folks who watch and listen to this uh, program here. And his research interests are populations, misconceptions, and reactions to extreme weather, the impacts of climate change, and uh, trying to understand a, uh, the emotional impacts of these events. And uh, having Having had a big tornado outbreak here last year, I know folks in Alabama had one, of course, uh, about a week and a half after ours here in North Carolina. We had a school that was hit pretty much directly. Granted, ours was on a Saturday, but we had a school that was hit, and the students had to not go to school at that place for a long period of time and got a very small taste of the emotional side of, of uh, weather. But uh, anyway, Bob Drost is here to talk about a couple of research projects that he's involved with. Bob, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So uh, tell us a little bit about the study that uh, you and Jay worked on in terms of uh, how people watch television weathercasts and what they're looking for when they do this. This is, this is fascinating stuff. Yeah, it's actually, <clears throat> it's actually pretty cool. I mean, when I first started out, um, you know, looking at and, and the, the gist of most of the research I did was really surrounding how people make decisions and how they behave when there's severe weather warnings, right, particularly tornadoes. Um, I met Jay at a, um, a conference uh, uh, out in Boulder, and we got to talking, uh, you know, about more of, I want to say, more of the communication piece, and obviously, you know, the broadcast meteorologists are kind of at the center of that, right? Um, so what we did was, you know, we were interested, there's so much going on on a screen during your typical weather, uh, your weather warnings, right? You have the warning scrolls at the bottom, sometimes you have the guy, you know, out there actually, you know, in the middle of the storm. You have, of course, the, the weather caster, broadcast meteorologist kind of describing the situation, making recommendations. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on visually and, you know, even with the audio. Um, so uh, what Jay did was he actually came up with two roughly, you know, half minute clips um, of a typical weather forecast. Uh, one where he was actually looking directly at the camera, you know, pretty much reading what was on the screen next to him as far as the forecast temps, that kind of stuff. But there was stuff still changing. They had a little inset scene that was changing, you know, according to what the you know, forecast was going to be. Um, and then he had an almost identical one where he was actually gesturing, you know, with his hands and his body toward the individual elements to make up the forecast. Because um, there's been a lot of research done about how gesturing can impact um, the communication and even comprehension you know, of what's being said in front of somebody, whether it's a teacher teaching or weathercaster, you know, forecasting weather, um, you know, all types of differences. Um, so basically we took those two clips, um, we, we recruited some folks at the university, um, and I work specifically in the geocognition research laboratory, so we do a lot of this, you know, how do people interpret and understand science and things like that. Um, and we put them in front of an eye tracker, and I'm not sure if, if you're all familiar with what an eye tracker does. Yeah, uh, tell us about that. Yeah, well, basically what we can do is we can put images. They can be, they can be you know, a survey. They can be a video, um, almost anything you want in front of somebody. It's calibrated, and then you go ahead and you can, in this instance, we'll have the person watch the video. Um, and what, it, what the eye tracker does is it actually records their gaze, their fixation, you know, what they're looking at as, you know, the video is, is being played. So what we were able to do is actually go and see exactly where these folks um, were looking and how long they were looking, um, you know, while Jay was given the forecast in the two different situations. So, we, of course, we were looking to say, wow, if uh, the weathercaster is gesturing toward the different parts, parts or elements of the forecast, are people going to pay more attention to it? And are they going to comprehend it and remember it? Because after, after the uh, eye tracking was actually completed, um, we had a follow-up survey, a retention survey, um, to see exactly what they remembered of the forecast. Um, so we put, you know, we put a number of people through this, and then um, at that point, you know, we collected the data and we started chunking the data, and we picked out um, what they call areas of interest off those videos. So we had one around Jay's face, we had it around his hands, we had it around the forecast, specific temperatures in the forecast, uh, the station banner, and then that inset scene that was changing. And so what we were looking at and what we were hoping to find is like, okay, wow, we're going to find out exactly how much, how much time people spend fixating or looking at, you know, the actual forecast versus Jay's face or Jay's hands or Jay's shirt or tie. Um, and then, you know, we were obviously trying to draw some conclusions based on that, on 
know, what's the best way to communicate weather, you know, a weather forecast. Um, so that's, that was what it all started out to be. Um, and um, the results were kind of interesting. Um, we actually found that um, the gesturing in some ways actually detracted from uh, what was going on. Um, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're kind of saying that that might be that people were actually focusing on his hands and what his hands were doing and that maybe was pulling people's, you know, fixation or attention away from the forecast in some instances. Um, but we also found people spending a lot of time looking at Jay's shirt, looking at Jay's tie, and even some of the, I, want, I don't, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to be opinionated, but the clutter uh, that goes on, you know, you had the station, <laughs> we've had a lot of people <laughs> looking at the station banner, which is awesome, mm -hmm. I suppose, if, you know, you own the station, right? But if you're trying to communicate the message, you know, the forecast, um, in some ways, that can be kind of distracting to what the you know the weathercaster is trying to communicate to his audience. So. I think Edward Tufty calls that chart junk, <laughs> chart all the clutter and stuff that we put around. And and yeah. you know from a branding standpoint, you want to have that there to try and reinforce that people are watching a certain station and and brand management, and all that kind of stuff. I I tend to favor a minimalist approach to that, yeah. and that may just be because I'm a bit of a Tufty disciple, but. Um, I, I like that minimalized bit, and I, I tend to see it as you do, as perhaps a, a little more clutter than is necessary. Um, it's interesting, though, you talked about, I want to ask you, because the gesturing part, we teach people that gesturing and pointing draw is supposed to draw attention to things on the screen or things that we want people to pay attention to, and your study is saying maybe that's counterproductive. Yeah, maybe it is kind of productive. And I, you know, of course, I probably like all researchers say we have more work to do. Um, but there can be, you know, there can be some interesting reasons for that. I mean, if people are already focusing or already fixating on um, the forecast because they're truly interested in it, they want to know what's going on, it could be that they, you know, the interruption that could be perceived as, you know, the hands pointing toward the forecast um, could be detracting their, you know, detracting them or, you know, shifting their attention away. Um, even facial movements can do the same thing. I mean, humans are obviously very facial focused, right, in what we do. So, um, you know, that it's, I think there's some possibilities that might surround, you know, those types of questions that we probably need to dig a little deeper and find out exactly, you know, how this is impacting. I think the, um, the intent was, of course, to have the gesturing reinforce the forecast mm -hmm. and then obviously have the people remember more of the forecast afterwards, you know, where there was gesturing occurring. Um, but in reality, we didn't really find that much of a difference in how well people remembered the forecast, whether Jay was gesturing or not. Um, but it's also some of the questions we asked, the questions we asked were um, multiple choice, right? So mm -hmm. we would ask, you know, on Tuesday when Jay's forecast, was it going to be sunny or was it going to be cloudy? Um, and really probably to get more of the comprehension of the people that were looking at Jay's forecast, um, it much, would have been much better to ask more open-ended questions to really get a feel for how the comprehension really took place as far as just, you know, how much can I remember 30 seconds after I see a forecast, so. Now, Jay, I, one of the things that, uh, you know, looking at, at some of the PowerPoint slides and hearing Bob talk about it, um, maybe some things that perhaps aren't what we're taught at TV school, those of us who have had anything other than on-the-job training for the, the television part of this business. Um, did this, did the results of this change the way you do the weather every night on Kello, or are you still waiting for more data, or, or what? I may need to unmute there. Whoops. There we go. Okay. There um, we go. Yeah, one of, one of the things that... Um, did I do it again? No, you're good. Okay. Sorry about that. One of the things that I did um, that I did notice uh, was uh, following up on uh, on Bob's study was uh, um, I, I tried to minimize the Italian hands thing. You know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I like to <laughs> I like to gesture when I'm talking and things like that. But actually, um, after seeing. Um, Bob's uh, eye tracking study was able to see where people were gazing, and a lot of times it was it was wasted effort. Um, if they were looking at my hands um, rather than paying attention to what I was saying or looking at the graphics, um, it really is wasted. Um, and you were not getting across the what I'm trying to get across. Uh, carrying that to the next step, um, as was I can't, at NWA, I can't remember uh, is Dave Freeman or Chuck Lofton, I think, asked the question. Well, 
if the gestures can be a hindrance, what happens if you take the TV person off the screen altogether and show just graphics? Um, do they actually understand the forecast better? Do they comprehend it better? Do they remember it better? And uh, actually, that's something that Bob's working on right now. And as a TV guy, I'm almost kind of scared to <laughs> find out the results of that. I, I don't like where this show's going. We need to talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about minimizing, you know, talking with your hands, and that's something, um, you know, I I had to work with a number of students at NC State every year, and. One of them uh, is a great personality. She's got a, a, a knack for being able to talk to her audience in a way that I, I haven't really seen in a lot of other places. Does a really good job with it, but she talks with her hands just constantly, and that's something that we had to you know, we had to work with her about it. Just you know, it's okay every now and again to make a gesture, but maybe you're saying I don't know. Is it almost that we should just not gesture at all, or is it are there times where that's still a good thing, or do we know yet? I think if you don't gesture, you you look stiff. So mm -hmm. I think you got to find the happy medium there. But uh, um, um, Bob said he pointed out to me that I was doing a lot of worthless uh, gesturing. Okay. Uh, in terms of wait, but determined by what? I'm I'm fascinated by this. What was what was the determining Ke Ke factor? Kevin only knows one gesture. Well, you know, it's, <laughs> it's it's funny you say that because there's a guy in this market who who very obviously for I guess a long time in his career has three or four what I would call coached in hand gestures that were that were put on him or put into him a long time ago and they almost kind of rotate around. So I'm really fascinated by this as, as to what what to hey, and, and, and uh, let, let me stop you, Kevin, because w when I was uh, in Dallas, this was a long time ago, the consultant had hand gesture numbers. He right. numbered <laughs> the hand gestures. Yeah. And he would recommend, over here you want to use a number 9, which is the roll. Oh, my gosh. Oh, over here you might want to consider the 13, which is the <laughs> over-the-back <laughs> gesture. You know? right. I, I'm serious. And, we, and this guy was probably making, you know, 300 grand telling weather people to number your hand gestures. So I, you know, I, yeah. list those. I, I have yeah. a, I have a number for some of those hand gestures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think for all of us, you know, the, the, the idea is we've got to, I, I, it's probably somewhat dependent on your personality, but you know, I, I know James, you like to use your hands and I do too. Uh, but, we can't let it get in the way of the information. And, uh, you know, there's a time for that, too, obviously, during times of severe weather, things like that. You want to be very careful because the message is so important. Yeah. And sometimes your personality might be a little bit more important. Well, we got silly there for a minute because I wanted to know what, 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 what classifies or qualifies a worthless hand gesture. Um, Anything you do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well... What, when Bob was uh, was using the eye tracking on my things, um, uh, one of the one of the things I really wanted to be specific about was I had some words on the screen, and when I pointed to those words, the audience did follow those. But at other times, I noticed that, like when I had my hands in front of my body and I was gesturing just to emphasize words and things like that, people's gaze was taken away from the information and taken away from my face, which is another method of communication. But then it gets down on my hands, and that's kind of a worthless place to be looking. Um, and another worthless place to be looking, Bob, you want to tell about your, uh, the post, uh, the post uh, survey that you conducted and the clinker question you asked them? <laughs> oh, you mean you about your tie, Jay? Yeah. Yeah, um, we actually had a surprising number of people, um, you know, given the short time that Jay did the, the weather cast was under 30 seconds, actually recall the color of Jay's tie and his, you know, and even his shirt, which was kind of interesting because I don't think necessarily Jay was all that worried about the tie that he was wearing or that it was all that important to what he was trying to communicate. But again, I think it just shows you kind of probably need to be aware of what your audience may be distracted by or what they may focus on you know, instead of what, you know, you're really trying to reinforce. 
Now, Bob, you talked about people were looking at the banners on the graphics, the station logos, and things like that. Yeah. Are there? Have you, are you far enough along that you can answer or, or help us design better graphics, or to say make some recommendations about we should use this and not this in terms of you know? There's a lot of you know, discussion about 3D and skylines right. and you know, text placement and, and whether we should stand in front of it or whether it should always be on one side or the other. And uh, Are you far enough along to be able to make any recommendations about that? Um, I don't think I'm far enough along to make recommendations. I can tell you that's where my research is heading. It's, my research actually started off quite differently. I was actually looking at how the difference between knowledge and experience would impact the way people behave, right? And, dis and make decisions, but what I found out very quickly was, is although that's very important, the way that information is also communicated to the audience is just almost is just as important or maybe just maybe more important. So um, I have a study that is actually kicking off this January where we're looking at like a, a current, like a, a clip that Jay told, you know, sent me, but it's actually a um, tornado warning, right? But we actually have another um, one of the guys in our collaborative group working on an animated warning you know, same text, same type of thing, but it's actually animation. And then we're actually stripping away all the visuals and just doing an audio as well. Um, we're going to take a look, we're going to do some eye tracking, we're going to see what people are looking at, and then we're going to try to combine those elements, um, if, if that's what the research says we should do, to see if we can come up with a better method of communicating that warning. So part of that, obviously, is also the way things are going to be laid out. The colors, for instance, that we use, there's a big difference in how people perceive messages just based on color, right? And their, even their level of understanding of what you're trying to communicate. I mean, there's some, color, there's some common ones out there, but, um, you know, there's people in our group that are also working on that, and that's going to be a part of what we're doing. So, I mean, I think it's interesting, though, if you look at Jay's um, clip that we had, uh, the, the forecast was kind of interesting. It was like partly cloudy, 78 degrees, and yet the, the like the station banner did it. It was animated. It was you know you had changing colors in the background scene. So it was almost designed to you know refocus people's attention on the changing colors, the changing scenery, the animated you know banner versus a you know a text that was I want to say it was dry, but it was it was text on a screen, right? It wasn't moving. It wasn't doing anything. So. Um, that's that's exactly the kind of stuff that we're working at. I'm looking at right now, um, but I can't at this point. I would not at this point sit down and say oh, I think I can help you design a better, uh, you know, a better layout. Hopefully, um, though, that's what we're going to get, and we're going to get get there in a fairly decent amount of time. That's going to be a big focus of, you know, this winter and early spring. Well, Bob, one of the things that you did look at was that uh, hockey stick graphic, and maybe you can talk about that because my takeaway from that was is that simplicity is very important. Yeah, that's again, we have um, you know I'm not the only one in the geocognition research lab, and lab and, and Julie Lavarkin is an amazing mentor and advisor there, and she's really intuitive when it comes to a lot of this stuff. And we took um, the traditional hockey stick hockey stick graph for climate change. I'm, I'm going to <laughs> yeah. Okay. And we, we we again we eye tracked using that image. That was you know, coming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we found out what people were looking at. Well, people were not looking at what that graph was trying to communicate. They were looking all over the place, but they weren't looking at what was trying to be what was trying to be communicated. Um, and so uh, again, um, Stephen Thomas, one of the people in our lab, um, Dr. Thomas, um, sat down, redesigned that graph to make it much more functional, much more realistic, much more informative in a very in a very I want to say just, you know, in your face manner. So we read, we went again and we, I tracked that and we found out that, wow, now people are actually paying attention to the area that we want them, which is kind of the present where things are changing. You know, um, they were looking specifically, you know, at the different um, scales. So they had a much better idea of what we were trying to communicate on that graph versus the hockey stick, like again, where they were looking, they were looking at what was going on, you know, back a hundred years ago. They were looking at the titles. They were kind of all over the board. Um, so that's the kind of that's the kind of stuff that we're looking to incorporate into you know newscasts, weather warnings, you know, like Jay's talking about to get the message to the people as quickly, as succinctly, um, you know, as possible, so that's communicated. But I mean, let, let me ask a serious question: Does it really matter what we wear? You're saying people are looking at ties and. All this other stuff. I mean, you know, I'll be honest with you. I, I haven't thought about what I wear in years, and anybody can tell that by looking at me. But <laughs> is that? And, and and we've got a problem here because you know we had a tornado outbreak last year where in this state, two hundred fifty-two people died, despite excellent 
advance notice. Excellent warning. So, so the, the closed really, you think, have something to do with com weather communication? Um, I, I don't know if you can. Well, I can't say necessarily close. I suppose we could do a study where we got some guy in a suit and the other guy naked, and we could see if there's a difference. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> okay. brother! Title, title. title. <laughs> yeah. But um, <laughs> you know, I mean, certainly, I mean, people are visual kind of by nature, right? And. Um, depending on the message that's being communicated, I think you could have different levels of impact. If it's just a weekly weather forecast, you know, maybe it's you know, maybe it's more important, or maybe it's more impactful because maybe it's not all that exciting. And it's like, wow, he's got a polka dot tie, and that's kind of weird, you know. Versus a, you know, a tornado warning, where I mean, you would hope at least suspect that people weren't going to necessarily focus as much on what the person's wearing versus the message that's being communicated, right? So, I'm, you know, that's that's kind of up in the air. James, if you know it's a big day, are, are you not thinking at all about what you're going to wear? I, I really don't. Um, and, and you know me, I kind of, I mean, I don't go naked, but but I don't wear the traditional jacket. You but know, there is a meme around your suspenders. Yes, but, you know, <laughs> pe pe the, the, the thing is, and, and, you know, people say, well, if he's got, you know, no jacket and he's wearing these suspenders, then we've got a problem. And if he rolls up his sleeves, we've got a real problem. And while it's kind of comical, I, I think that it's I have to adhere to that now. And I mean, honestly, if I think we've got a really serious situation, I've got to roll up my sleeves, even if I'm not hot. Right. So I, I know that people are paying attention to things like that, and I don't want to do anything that's distracting. And uh, this is what you know, I don't know anything about this. I mean, I, I used to laugh at those consultants because I, but you know. Anything that will help us communicate weather better during an emergency is something I'll, I'm all for. So, Bob, you, you figure this out and yeah, start a cons start a consulting business. You and Kevin can start a consulting business. <laughs> he really should because he's picking up. Uh, you know, where all the where the maggots and the AR and Ds, you know, kind of fell off. They all fell off a cliff some years ago as the economy went down and whatnot. But I've got two really interesting, I think, interesting questions. The first one maybe leans a little more toward Jay. Despite what Bob, and this is playing devil's advocate, but despite what Bob comes out with, do we think that there's any possible way that the runaway graphics that are produced now by graphics departments, by new, the management, whatever, that we would actually potentially reel them in? I, I got to say, in many cases, no. I, uh, I'll go you one. I'll go one better for you. Don't you think the art departments are going crazy now that we're at 1080i or 720p right. and have a you know right. big wide screen? Yeah. No, they and just some, put, and some departments want to put stuff on the wings. I mean, there's some right, stations right, that right. do that, yeah. and, and I've even advocated in certain circumstances doing that in lieu of doing something else that might be even more distracting. But in terms of, you know. nearly every news channel constantly. And one of my questions, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, Kevin, I'll let you get back, but one of my questions has always been, is that any, is that worth anything? Do people actually read it? Do they get it? Do they act on it? Or are we just wasting their time? Yeah. But, um, it's fa I mean, in, in, at our sister station, WFAA, they just put in a new graphic system here in the last week or two, and there was all this buzz around the television station, and I was going, wait a minute, didn't they just have a new graphic system like 15 minutes ago? Which they <laughs> did, but they had to have the newest, greatest, latest thing to go spend their budget allocation, and it just gets fancier and crazier and, 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 and more wild, and I, I just, I don't know if we're going to reel that, you know, put that horse mm. back in the barn. But my well, other question... That's, that's one sorry. of those things, Kevin, real quick, uh, that's one of those things that what Bob is studying right now with during the severe, during the tornado outbreak, are they looking at the meteorologist, are they looking at the Doppler radar, are right. they looking at the bottom of the screen and all that. I think that will really tell us a lot about uh, exactly where people's attention is. And that's going to be pretty important because, you know, that's a, a time of high importance. And yeah. if they're paying attention to the wrong thing, we're wasting our time. You know, it would be fascinating, but a lot of work is to go back into the, I guess, maybe into the 80s when these research projects were being done that probably are responsible in some way for the ramp up in graphics and see what the results were from the consulting firms at the time. Because, I mean, I, I assume that we got here some way, but that, that, that would be a, a, an interesting bit of work, but a lot of work as well. But I wanted to ask both of you guys, I, I tell a little story, and I think I may have told this before, but just to get your reactions, 
there was a day some years ago where I, I had a flat tire one day. And so I drove to the Goodyear shop to get my, fa my flat tire fixed. And I'm sitting in the waiting room um, with several other people having their cars worked on. And, and they had a television on in there. And it was a day in which we'd had some rain in the morning. And I think it had cleared out by 9, 9.30. And I was there at lunchtime. And they had... Um, uh, Channel 4 on, the Fox affiliate, and Evan Andrews, who is the morning midday guy, uh, was doing the noon weather. And I watched, there were three people there, and I watched them because this is a great thing, and this is kind of the heart of the question. You're, you're, you're watching people in an incubator or in a lab situation where they're given a task as opposed to sitting in their living rooms or sitting in the Goodyear tire shop or whatever. So it had rained that morning, and he came on, and he did his, his happy talk, his cross toss talk section. He did his, uh, and they were watching, the three of them were watching. He did his current conditions, the three of them were watching. He went to the radar, the three of them were watching, and then he spent about two minutes, minute and a half, two minutes doing where he was going to fly, and the H's and the L's were going to move around, and the cold fronts. But I'm telling you, the nanosecond that he left the radar, all three of those people independently turned away from the television set, they turned their attention away, and didn't come back until he got to the forecast boards at the end of the segment. And I would love to hear both of you comment on that. Um, well, the first thing I would say is it may not, it may not necessarily have been be the fact that there were H's and L's, but uh, you know the old primacy latency effect where people remember the first thing you said and they really remember the last thing you said and they don't pay mm -hmm. attention to the middle. Right. Um, that could have something to do with it. But, you know, that's what consultants have been telling us forever is that, uh, you know, lose the, lose the, lose the, uh, lose the details in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, so, I, I, you know, I know what you're talking about because I, I, the same thing happens to me if I'm watching a, a weathercast. I, I, you know, I daydream down the middle waiting for the payoff at the end. Yeah, Bob, what do you think about that? And then also comment on, again, you're watching people sort of in a laboratory situation. Yeah, and I mean, I think I have to agree with what Jay was saying. I mean, if, if, especially if you're looking at what people are trying to pull out of that warning or that forecast, I mean, they're going to find out or tune into what's important to them and probably walk away with that information as soon as they possibly can. And then a lot of the stuff or fluff that's maybe going on in between, um, they're going to kind of tune out because that's not, what's, that's not what they're looking for, right? I mean, it's... Um, I know there's a lot that go into a lot of these different forecasts, and all the markets are different too. But I mean, I even see that, you know, here in our local station, um, we have a, a <laughs> we have a weather forecast. Hey, hey Bob, here. what 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 market are you in? So we'll know. Um, in Detroit. Okay. Okay. And we have we have some you know broadcast meteorologists here that are very you know they make up cutesy names and you know for certain things and they have a lot of cute pictures running through their forecasts and everything. And it's like I personally tune myself out completely because. I find it kind of ridiculous. That's not. I'm not. I'm not looking at the weather forecast to be entertained by you know these like I said QC things. I'm looking for the information that's important to me. Like maybe I'm doing something tomorrow. I need to know what the temperature is. I need to know what's going to rain. That type of thing. So once I've gotten what I need, I tend to you know I tend to tune the rest of it out. Well, while, while we're talking about this stuff, here's what I'd like to know. I believe that most of the people in my market are getting the actual forecast off a smartphone app at some point during the day. And by the time they come to the evening news, if they're going to sit down and watch that, they already have a pretty good grasp of what the weather's going to do. What I what would help me is what are they looking for? What what kind of information would be useful for them on television <laughs> after get, getting it from a crap app, you know? Hey, um, James, James, I can tell you that so far you're still wrong on that one. Um, the uh, good. There was a study that, uh, in fact, uh, Bob references it in his uh, paper, and I was going to talk to him about it. There's been an update. You know, a few years ago, there was a study uh, done out of uh, out of Boulder that uh, talked about where people got their weather information. And TV was number one, all the sources. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to I don't want to spill the beans on something that they're going to be publishing, but I, I I don't think I'd be online to say the TV is still the number one source, although. The numbers two, three, four, and the others are changing. But, yeah, and you got to uh, look at the trend. We, we are still. We're yeah. You're right. You're right about that. But James said that uh, he thought that they were getting it from their app and then tuning him in or not at night. But still, still, uh, still, TV, TV is still number one even in even in these days. Well, and, and I think I would like to see the demographic breakdown on that. You know, 
what age group, you know, and I think if you look at maybe the 18 to 24, the younger ones, I'm not so sure TV would still be number one. That's right. But that, that's, that's good to know. I mean, all, all I need is a job until I retire, and as old as I am, <laughs> it's, it's rapidly approaching, you know? That's right. I think you'll well, be able to play out the string. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. A, I agree with James. There's a certain amount of inertia, uh, and, there's, and there's probably a certain expectation on those that are left, and yes, there are a lot of people left, but if you, if you radically changed the level of presentation, you're changing people's habits, and that's going to be unsettling for them. Yeah, well, we're, we're meteorologists. What do we do when we're looking at long-term computer models? We look at the trend. So why should this be any different? Right. So let me ask this, and, and based on, this is for both Bob and Jay, based on, on what you've done so far, what you've learned, and, you know, Kevin's anecdote and everything else, should we be, I mean, the, are the consultants right? Have they been right since the 80s that we should just not try and communicate science at all? Just go currents, forecast, boom, in and out, 90 seconds? Or are viewers expecting, wanting, getting some of that information from some of those weathercasts? Is there, is there a middle ground? You know, what is that? Well, Bob's a social scientist, so I'm going to uh, <laughs> let him answer that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, that's a toughie. I mean, I guess you need, number one, you need to consider who's paying the consultants, right? Um, I don't know if that impacts it <laughs> it's or not. not the meteorologist. <laughs> <that's for laughs> <No, sure. laughs> um, and, you know, I'm not in, I'm not in that business, um, but I don't know if maybe there could be some preferences leaning one way or another about what you're going to tell people they need to do or versus not what to do. I think demographics pay, plays a big point, uh, part of it. Um, I've done some, you know, Jay was talking a little bit earlier about where people get their information from, and I did in that small study that I had done prior to this on memory, you know, obviously television came up, you know, the, the media as the number one. The internet was followed kind of closely, but I also found that a lot of people associated some of those apps with the television media. Because, you know, a lot of them are still, you know, like here it's like, you know, local for WDIV. It's still branded that way on their app, right? So you need to be careful how you ask that question. Or, you know, you need to be like, so, yeah, I'm getting it from, you know, television because my app says WDIV. So I think you need to be a little bit careful um, with that. But, I mean, it's obviously still very important. Um, and then I guess, I mean, again, demographics are really important. We found... Um, on some surveys that we did that uh, the older people that we had surveyed uh, were much more in tune with the uh, weathercaster and getting their information from him versus seeing the radar images um, and some of the more techie stuff. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that you need to be, you need to take into consideration, especially from a social perspective, um, you know, when you're kind of going down that discussion. It's... There's a lot of inputs, I guess. Let's say there's a lot of inputs <laughs> before you can come up with some real definitive answers. Well, you hey, know, what Kevin, makes... Kevin, do, do we dare ask Bob about social media? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, the point I was going to make that may, he made me think of is he said there's a lot of inputs and, and there's a lot of destinations or outputs now. I, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people, especially in old media, are not considering is there is no one right answer anymore. During the days of, let's put on the newscast, and that was the only place, you had to pick something. But that was the only choice people had. But now, there are as many desires on the part of the audience as there are people, almost. So, it's, 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 it's really important not to try and pick something and say, this is the right answer, this is the way we go, when, you have, when people have options. And they have different requirements and different needs, and I think it's important to remember that. And, and I think that's that's media. and that's actually what I tell my students is that you know, it sort of dovetails in with what James was talking about is that if people are getting their their forecast information from this if this is either a primary the primary or one of the becoming a, a central place to get that information for that's audio pretty listeners much, Nate is holding up his yeah, phone yeah I'm sorry yes. <laughs> yeah. where's your vuvuzela I, they yeah. know that I'll bring that yeah so anyway, if they're doing that off the iPhone, if they're getting a forecast from their Android device or what have you, then if that's all we're giving them on television and just putting a pretty, or in my case, not so pretty face in front of it, are we really adding any kind of value to what people are getting as opposed to 
you know, people getting something from the television broadcast and from our websites that they can't get from a, from an app. Is that, that is a, a, an excellent point, Nate. I mean, if we just rehash the stuff that they're getting on their 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 smartphone, I mean, that's stupid. But mm -hmm. what we need to do as meteorologists is use, I mean, the, your phrase to use our weather brains and tell them something they're not getting off the internet. I mean, like the conversation that was going on just before uh, um, uh, James rolled the tape. I mean, it, what are the odds of snow in Texas on Christmas Day? I mean, you talk about that in your weather cast, and people are interested. And that's not something that they're going to get just by looking at the internet. Okay. Yeah, and if I can interrupt, um, another big issue and what you're talking about there, Nate, is, is trust, public trust, right? Mm -hmm. um, they, they can look at their phones, their iPhones, or whatever, and they're making their own judgments. You know, they're making their own call on what they think the weather is going to be. And even if a lot of that information is very similar, but you know it's coming from Nate Johnson, and they have an inherent trust or distrust, you know, based on past experience. Right? Um, that's going to make an impact, you know, on how their impressions of how their information, the weather information, mm -hmm. is best communicated to them, and what their preferences are. You know, sometimes coming from a real live person that I know I can count on is going to be a little more mean more to me than looking at my phone saying, "Wow, there's a big green blob coming. I think it might rain, but." And I'm not really sure because I'm not a meteorologist. Yeah, I think that's something that we we learned a lesson here at WREL when we first rolled out our our iPhone app, and at the time it was pulling data. It was branded with our chief's face, and it was the official app. Chief meteorologist's last name is Fischel, so you know that sort of tied in the branding very closely. And as a result, when people went to the app and the numbers didn't match what they saw on television they said, well, what's going on? Because they were associating the app with the station, which in our case is very tightly wrapped up into the, the brand of the chief meteorologist. And so they're having a hard time trying to rationalize why these two things were different. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that certainly is going to play into that, I, I'd imagine, right? Was that yeah. a question for me? Uh, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> no, that that would totally. I mean, I can see how that would totally play into it. I mean, you're you're inserting doubt, and you have trust issues. I mean, you're car you're causing some confusion there, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and especially in a situation where people are looking for some guidance mm -hmm. on maybe what they need to do next, or even what they're going to wear. Um, I think it's important that they get that message consistently. I, I would echo that, and I think it's real. It's really been a tragedy that, in many, many cases, especially amongst the groups. See, Nate's lucky in a little way because he has. All of Madison, the Wisconsin. Well, no, I mean all the templated websites, ah, uh, oh. IBEW and all IBS these other places. And IBS, World thank you. Telerep, uh, World right, Real. all these guys that came across That's with right. these these automated um, uh, website solutions. And I mean, I still to this day don't know where there is forecast data on the TXCN website, and I don't have the vaguest idea where it comes from, <laughs> uh, and, and I have no way of doing it. I know another guy. I know another guy at a, at a network O and O that if he wants to change a number, he has to call somebody in New York City to get it done. Oh, <laughs> no, please. Yeah, uh, and oh. I think it's unfortunate that we yeah. ceded that responsibility, but I think it was it was due in large part to the fact that a lot of these groups and a lot of the management just didn't understand the early days of the web and what the potential was, but they also didn't see any immediate payoff. And I think there was a there was a real there was a real disappointment level that they couldn't turn this the way they did in television and make these big um, these big rewards pay off very quickly that just never was going to materialize and there's been a lot of difficulty accepting that um, e even today and, and I think it's unfortunate but you guys all bring up a good point is you you create that uncertainty you infuse that that distraction that confusion in there and, and why would they bother to come to yeah. you then? and in a severe weather situation anyway we know that combined with optimism bias and some other risk risk perception issues that if you give people uncertainty they're going to try and interpret that uncertainty in their favor so right. for example if you're to take the as we're heading into the winter season you know we have a bunch of snow lovers around here and if you've got three stations and they're all differing on how much snow they expect 
then people are going to believe the one that lines up most with what they want mm-hmm. to have happen. And so kids are always going to love the station that's predicting the most snow. <laughs> uh, the old wish, wish casting. Wish casting. Yeah. And, and, yeah, but the same thing that gets more serious when you start talking about tornado warnings. And if you've got, that's why in, in risk situations, speaking with one voice or in harmony with the other messaging situations or messaging strategies is that, if people, if there's uncertainty, if there's a gap that they can interpret as well, maybe it's not as bad as they say it is because one guy says it's bad and the other guy doesn't really seem to be angling that way, guess what? They're going to use that uncertainty as an excuse to sit on the couch and not do what they need to do in that situation. And so, you know, that uncertainty issue is, is sort of taken this far afield, but, you know, making sure that all, at least within the station, we're speaking with one voice, not only with the forecast, but with severe weather is that much, that much more important, um, which is why the, the, the eye tracking study is interesting because, it, you know, the idea that something we've been taught to do for ages could potentially be causing that uncertainty or at least allowing people to misinterpret. It's a little scary. <laughs> I tell you what, guys, let's take a quick break here. We're going to do uh, Professor Peters with Weather Brains 101. We're going to come back with a quick weather roundup. We will have the email inbox, the picks of the week, and much more as Weather Brains rolls along. Weather Brains 101 with Professor Peters. Meteorology is a physical science with an abundance of scientific terms, but the weather affects everyone, so there are also common terms for the weather elements. Take, for example, a mackerel sky. No, it doesn't mean that fish will fall from the sky. A mackerel sky is a formation of cirrocumulus or altocumulus clouds that resemble the pattern of scales on a mackerel's back. In Germany and France, these clouds are known as sheep clouds since their pattern resembles a flock of sheep. And in some regions, they are known as buttermilk sky. Cirrocumulus clouds that make up the mackerel sky develop from cirrus clouds beginning to lower and clump together. Due to their relatively high altitude, they have a dappled look along with a silvery sheen. Typically, these clouds are associated with a change in the weather. And of course, with a distinctive cloud pattern, it opens the door for weather lures associated with them. For example, you may have heard, mackerel sky, mackerel sky, never long wet, never long dry. This item of weather lore comes from the days of sailing ships when the clouds were correctly viewed as likely forerunners of stormy weather. And how about this one? Mare's tails and mackerel scales make lofty ships take in their sails. This item of weather lore actually combines two kinds of clouds and a forecast. Small white and fluffy cirrocumulus clouds typically consist of ice crystals and form at altitudes around 18 to 30,000 feet and they often form well ahead of depressions in their associated fronts. Now, mackerel skies and mare's tails describe forms of cirrocumulus and twisted sheaves of cirrus, respectively implying strong high-level winds. If they proceed in approaching a warm front, they will thicken and winds will veer from the northwest to a more southwest direction. Often, the winds will strengthen, too. Now, the typical width of an approaching warm front is, say, about 300 miles from the first hazy clouds to the onset of rain. So if you see a mackerel sky, then you're about 250 miles ahead of the rain. Since the typical movement of a system is about 30 miles an hour, the weather should change in the next six to eight hours. Now, on the other hand, if a mackerel sky is made up of the somewhat bigger and darker alto cumulus, they might indicate a short-term improvement. Alto cumulus mainly consist of water droplets and typically form at altitudes between about 10 and 18,000 feet. However, if they are becoming thicker and bigger, they might turn into a thunderstorm later, often associated with a cold front. These are examples of weather lore that came from keen observations of folks vulnerable to the weather. All right, let's talk about current weather again. We're doing a show here on Monday, the 17th of uh, December, and uh, up on the uh, screen here I have the National Weather Hazards Map, and we've got two storms of interest in the next uh, uh, 10 days or so. Uh, one will be producing a whopper of a snowstorm, perhaps, from western Kansas into uh, Wisconsin. We have a blizzard watch tonight for western Kansas, including places like Goodland, and winter storm watches from Omaha up to uh, Des Moines and uh, Green Bay. Uh, looks like, Jay, this one's going to stay south of you, huh? Whoop, mute button. He's nodding his head. <laughs> there we go. Here we go. Yes. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, it's going to just skirt to the south of us, southeast. So. Yeah, I, I hear you. And then we have the next one, which will be the storm around Christmas Day or the day after that. We've talked about that uh, in, in the pre-show. That might be an issue for folks that are trying to travel, but uh, that's so far away from what, where we are now. We'll deal with that one later. So enough of that. Uh, and I tell you what, uh, let's just go right to that good old Gmail inbox. Perfection Nate is an overflowing inbox this week. I can just feel it. Letters. We get letters. We get stacks and stacks of letters. All right. Uh, so first could, off, could we, is, wait, can we do some research on the dancing uh, during the email <laughs> thing that goes on? So, I, 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 so wait, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin is the guy that tells us to never refer to the video and all is what show I'm saying. long. He has referred to the video. Yeah, the, so. the, the, you're distracting all the video watchers by oh, doing the whatever. dance during the email thing. Uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too, Celis. Shut up. <laughs> <Yeah>. All right. <laughs> so so uh, first off, this was an email that we got last week, and we, we needed some time to set this up. But uh, Wesley Johnson has uh, whipped up a couple of weather songs, one about uh, his hometown of Kansas City and one about uh, Hawaii. And uh, James, cue one of those up, and let's listen to uh, a few seconds of this. All right, let's take the Kansas City weather song. Kind of sounds like Elton like John's to, uh, sing a tiny little dance song room. about the city I live in and the weather it has. <laughs> I call it Weather in Kansas City. <laughs> the weather in Kansas City is very interesting. One day it could be sunny, and then the next day. It just could be freezing rain, hail, thunderstorms, tornadoes, hot <laughs> wind, sunny again, light rain, but green clouds everywhere, snow, <laughs> ice, and snow again, before the ice melts, of course, and this is just a day in February. People I love ask, the... is this normal? I say, who knows? No, really, we don't know. As far as I can tell, I mean, meteorologists must love it here. Seriously. I love the use it's of the auto tuner in this. Oh yeah. Okay, let's play the, the same. play the Honolulu one now. All right, that that was the Kansas City song. This is the Honolulu weather song. Hello. This is a song about the city that I now live in and the weather that it has. I call it weather in Honolulu. <laughs> The weather in Honolulu is very interesting. Where's Tiny Tim? One day it could be <laughs> sunny, and then the next day it just could be sunny, 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 then sunny again. Oh look, a bit of rain, but that'll pass in about maybe 10 minutes. It's sunny on Sunday in 86, sunny on Tuesday in Hey, Brian, don't you play the ukulele? On Wednesday in no, I don't play any sunny instruments. I can't carry a tune in a wheelbarrow. That's right, but Brian plays the accordion, I forgot. People ask, is this normal? We say, yes. No, really, that's it. Meteorologists <laughs> must be bored to tears. Seriously. Is this is this the same guy that did both of these songs? <laughs> the it's the same. It's the same. iPhone app weather and plane. Honolulu is always the same. Always the same. The weather here is always, always, always. All right. Always. So that's uh, a little that. ditty by Wesley Johnson. We appreciate you sending those in. It, 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 it's still that music is still not as good as this. No. Okay. Pressure. The, the main energy part of this storm is just explosive. You let this roll, this baby. Yeah, come on, man. This is it. Right. Enough of that. All right. <laughs> so uh, we appreciate Wesley sending those in, and uh, we'll post a link to those on the uh, the old website there if you'd like to have more of that. He's got a, a channel of all this sort of stuff. All right. A uh, friend of the show, Michael W. Moss, sent us a video of a tornado touchdown in Edgewater, Florida. This is a pretty pretty amazing stuff in December, mind you. Uh, very unusual. Got an email from John Huntington, an interesting article about the New Jersey Transit Authority 
and where they moved their stuff to in advance of Sandy. Basically, the yard that they moved all of their trains to is in an area that flooded badly, and some folks seem to think that uh, maybe they should have known that ahead of time. And uh, very interesting. And, and at one point in that article, they blame, they, they cast a wide net of we didn't know, they didn't tell us, um, when in fact, at least from what I've seen, the, weather, the local weather service office there did a fantastic job of explaining where the water was going to go, and at least the writing was certainly on the wall uh, had they wanted to do it. Apparently, they didn't pick up the phone and call. They didn't ask whether they knew that they could or not. I don't know, but uh, an interesting article. We're going to be hearing a lot more about Sandy. By the way, those of you who've been listening know that uh, the Sandy service assessment team, there's been some challenges with that. They're, <laughs> they now have a team that has been commissioned, chartered, and they are planning to begin their work in early January. And remember the who, 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 is, who is on that team? Do we they know? They are not saying. The co-lead of the team is from NOAA Fisheries, and they're on the team, at least uh, according to the press release, in large part because they have a lot of management and team lead experience in stuff like this, although to what extent that is weather, I don't know. A couple of social scientists on the team, but they are all federal employees. There are no uh, academics, no, no external folks outside of the federal government on the team. So interesting. Uh, oh, wait, Brian, that. is it is it typical or is it typical to announce the team members beforehand? Is this is this atypical to not know? Uh, no. I mean, okay. it's also not typical to wait a month or how long? When, right. when, when did Sandy go in? A month and a half ago? Yeah, right. I be, mean, you know, they're, they're certainly change. taking their time. I mean, <laughs> people are going to have forgotten the storm. We're going to be on to the next one. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just think this whole thing is a bunch of crap. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Mike Smith agrees with you. I think uh, I don't think that's mischaracterizing mischaracterizing his opinion of it. But uh, anyway, so just to mention that since we've talked about it on the show before, the rest of the email this week, folks, you have stepped up and you have answered the call for Weatherbrains listener surveys. We appreciate these. Head over to weatherbrains.com. There's a gal with really big headphones, and she's really enjoying those headphones. And you just uh, <laughs> click on click on that, answer some questions, tell us uh, how you think we're doing. And I uh, want to give a shout-out first to uh, Dawson. He's 14 years old. He is from Kevin Sellis country in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Bedford, in fact. And uh, found out about us through the Weather Extreme videos that are posted on the Alabama Weather Blog, so we appreciate that. Brian Oswald, um, trying to think. He didn't list where he's from. That's probably, oh, nope, there it is. Uh, Waukesha or Waukesha, Wisconsin. So, Waukesha. Email from Steve Coughlin. Congratulations to JP or whoever is responsible. The audio podcast quality for the last two shows has been a phenomenal improvement <laughs> over the whole string of shows since the video hangout era began. So, uh, Yay, JP! Yeah, the vast majority of folks, is, as James is wont to say, listen to the program after the fact via podcast, and we want to make sure that the audio is clean, so we appreciate that. Of course, if you hear anything uh, that you'd like us to take a look at, certainly let us know. And finally, Brandon Daly. Uh, sent us a note from Tallahassee, Florida. A listener survey response has no comment. Said he'll email him if he thinks so. He thinks that the banter is great and the interactions and shenanigans make our show stand out and make every minute worth watching. So, yes. except for the bell. Yeah, Brandon, we appreciate <laughs> appreciate your thoughts and the check is in the mail. And that All is right. it for email this week. Awesome. Let's uh, let's hit the fog bank, and then we're going to come around with picks of the week. And let's go ahead and warn uh, Jay and Bob that they will need to have a pick of the week. Okay. Not to be uh, confused gonna... with Jay and Silent Bob, which is a whole other. <laughs> <Yeah, that. laughs> but let's roll the uh, fog bank here with Sky Day. Michael, I'm getting some unusual readings. Hello, Weatherbrains listeners. This is the fog bank. Send me your links for the fog bank on Twitter at Sky First up for this week from the National Weather Service, a proposal concerning the simplification of weather hazard announcements. The second pick is from Mike Moss with a YouTube link about the April 26, 1994 tornado in Lafayette, Indiana. Third, Jared Rennie sent a link to the National Climactic Data Center showing the historical probability of a white Christmas. My fourth pick is from Mark Vogan with a blog post about extreme cold in Asia right now. 
Finally, Kokoraz is doing a fundraiser, $5 for Kokoraz. I'll have a link to that information in my blog. Get out there and get your Kokoraz station set up for the new year. Thanks for listening. Skydaver out. All right, this is where we – thanks, Skydaver. Uh, this is where we go around the horn. Everybody shares something that is weather-related. And, and I'll just go ahead and start uh, because I've decided that Facebook is just rotten. Oh. You know, Ke Ke Kevin has been trying to tell me that for years. I, I use that as my pick. Are you doing the same thing? Your blog post? That's no, why. No. That's why, Kevin, oh. I okay. mentioned when I sent my email that uh, he's not allowed to steal my pick. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I'm. I. I. Have, I've just about had it. So many of television weather people think that they are reaching, you know, these thousands of people on Facebook, and they're not. You know, you, you got a hundred thousand people that like you. Well, you're reaching maybe, maybe ten thousand if you're lucky, or fifteen thousand. Uh, but you got to pay, and, and, and you could pay these goobers. You know. What what five hundred thousand dollars and you still wouldn't reach all of them? Uh, it, it's a scheme. It, it's a horribly ineffective way of distributing weather information. It's inconsistent. It, it's it's just it's it's rotten. So, and I mean, look, I'm not knocking them for making money. It's, I'm all for it. It's great. But for for what we do, disseminating important weather information, it's no good. So I just wanted to kind of give Google Plus a, a shout out here. Uh, it, it is the Google social network. Is it perfect? No, there's no such thing. But uh, is, are there large numbers of people there? Not really. But I do think it's growing. <laughs> I, and, and, and I do think that uh, uh, there is great potential uh, for this platform. So I, wanna, I want everybody that listens to this show to uh, get over here and try Google Plus. If you have a Gmail account, you, you've basically got a Google Plus account. And th there's a lot of weather weenies here. I mean, and they use circles. And uh, I probably should share my weather circle uh, because there's some excellent uh, meteorologists in here. And you'll get some really good information. So uh, I just get in there and try it. Circle some people or news organizations or weather people that you find interesting. And the 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 mobile apps I really think are amazingly good. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but the you know in my case the iPhone and the iPad Google Plus apps are far superior to most of the Twitter and Facebook apps. It's it's responsive. It's quick and it's elegantly good done. So. I challenge you to, to get off Facebook and go over and get on Google+. Plus. So there, that's my pick of the week. Let's go over to Brian <laughs> Peters, the internationally beloved meteorologist, to see if Brian has one for us this week. I do have one. Before I go, I wanted everybody to know that before I change the forecast, I have to call James Spam. <laughs> <laughs> no, brother. Man, <laughs> fly to New York. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he calls me a lot for changing the forecast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian, this is, just change his uh, forecast by one degree that every day. That'll make it happen. There you go. Yeah, as long as I trend it the right direction, there, Jay, I'm I'm okay. Uh, you know, this is the gift giving season, and uh, James had talked about having a gift show, and so I was just looking around at uh, weather gifts, and and I did a little search and came up with, and I would need to bill Amazon for this, but uh, I came up with a link that has like 20 pages of weather gifts. Um, so I'm going to just post that as mine, and I, I can't read the whole thing because it's humongous and all these characters and things in there, so it's not something simple, but it's, uh, it is through Amazon. But it's got a nice list of uh, varying prices from pretty expensive to fairly inexpensive. I, I know it, Brian. Brian's got a racket going here. He's going to insert that Amazon <laughs> affiliate code in the link, so he's going to get a cut out of everything that people buy off of that. Thing. Amen. I know, I know what you're doing. Brian, yeah. tell us two or three unique ones. I mean, we know there's weather stations and so on and so forth, but pick two or three that are different. Oh, gosh. Um, oh, oh, I thought a, you had it in front of you. No, no, I don't. I don't, Kevin. Um, right. I, there, there were some interesting ones in there. Uh, so, yeah, I, you, need to, you need to take a look at it. Yeah, Brian's playing Angry Birds. He's too busy. All right. Uh, no, that, that, that's great. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Kevin and see what Kevin's pick is for this week. I want to go last because I'm going to loop back on your uh, your comment. Your post. Okay. Your All right. Let's go to Nate. Nate, what's your pick? My pick is a, a video clip from actually last Friday evening's 11 o'clock news here in Raleigh at WREL-TV. Our chief meteorologist, Greg Fischel, had a shocking... <laughs> 
wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> it is only for the strong of stomach, and the uh, link will be posted. It's good stuff, though. It's really funny. It's, it's, it's good TV. This is Don't you mean large of stomach? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> I saw I saw one guy that happened to him like a long time ago. I want to say his name was John Elliott. Uh, had a red-haired guy, and he, he was like in some smaller market down here. The button flew off. It was funny, man. I mean, that <laughs> you know, you, it, you you can react to that in a lot of different ways. But I have not seen Greg's video, so I'll, I'll be looking for that. All right, uh, so now, Jay, we're, we're going to toss it to you. This is your pick of the week. What you got for us? I feel in my bones this is going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but um, uh, being from the North Country, I, I thought I'd better say something about winter weather. Um, when we're forecasting our bands of, uh, of snowfall, our projections anyway, um, it's not so important as to where the model is putting out uh, the heaviest snowfall as to the amount of uh, snowfall the model is putting out and then looking at the forcing that is produced inside the model, the front of Genesis, which is where that uh, the uh, heaviest band of snowfall is more likely to be. So uh, we use... Uh, 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 it, it's it's been an experimental NOAA site for years, um, but anyway, we we use uh, www.hpc.nsep.noaa.gov/mdd/mddoutput/slash, and I'll send you the link again. But in any event, it's a Thank you. it's a diagnostic uh, uh, page that you can look inside the model and see where the frontogenesis is occurring and and know where to better place your uh, uh, forecast snow bands. Ooh, this is good. I, I didn't know about this. Now, Gordon, not, not that we deal with that much down here, but like you, we, we inevitably get that little 50-mile-wide strip of heavy snow. And trying to nail that thing, it is so hard. So that, th this will give me something fun to play with. That is a great pick, Jay. Thank you. All right, Bob, <laughs> time for you to give us a pick of the week, something remotely related to weather. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is going to be a pick of the week, but I can get you something that really kind of pisses me off. Uh, <laughs> that's, okay. that's even better. <laughs> oh, um, and, that's my job. Yeah, it might, this, it might, this might make me somewhat unpopular in certain circles, but I'll just take the shot, right? Um, so euf euphemism, weather euphemism, things like Superstorm, as in Superstorm Sandy. Um, you know, I interact with a lot of people. I talk with a lot of people, and a lot of it's weather-related. And they're not weather experts. They're just people. And it's just stuff like that, you know, snowmageddon. It, like, ties in the whole world ending on Friday to these people, and people don't really understand what really goes on and what really happens and why things are what they are when that kind of stuff is communicated to the public. And, and, and I use one other example, which has just been kind of bugging me for quite a while. It's Torcon. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Come preach it. You preach it, brother. Yeah, you preach it. Down. Come on. I don't, want to, I don't want to burn any bridges to get myself in trouble, but severe weather warnings are already confusing enough and what people need to do and whether they should take cover or not. And to throw things out there, now we have probabilities. It's like I could be, I could be, right, I could have a tornado warning, but it only says I have a 6 out of 10 chance. So, hey, I'm going to go with that and roll the dice. Right? That, stuff like that really just pisses me off. <laughs> well, they've got a new one now. They they announced StormCon Storm this week. Storm yeah. Oh, brother. And my head's going to blow up. Oh. <laughs> it is entertaining, but, you know, okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of that kind of disappointment. <laughs> hey, Bob, that, that ended any chance of you getting that big job at the Weather Channel. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's why I was a little hesitant yeah. to put that out there. I mean, Join I, the, I, I join the club, some... Bob. I've been banished from there and the Weather Service for months now. <laughs> so, and I'm, I'm going to need something to do here shortly. I don't have much longer before I graduate, so that's probably you, wasn't the smart You, thing me, Kevin, and Trobeck <laughs> will just we'll, we'll bail out of this business and we'll start our consulting firm and we'll teach people how to do it right. All right. That's a great idea. All right, Kev, you, you got uh, you got five. The floor is yours for five minutes, so go. Make it good. Well, I yeah. was going to make my pick your blog post about what you were talking about, the Facebook thing, and it's from your uh, Alabama WX blog. But I, I wanted people to read it, but then I wanted to challenge you a little bit. And, and I actually started thinking about this a couple of weeks ago because uh, Brad, and I should have gotten Brad Panovich on tonight, he posted a video uh, a couple of weeks ago. Did you watch that, James? It was like an eight-minute long video on the on the. Uh, on the benefits of Google Plus for broadcasters and why it was good for search and so on and so forth. Did you see that? I, I saw him post that, but I did not get a chance to look at it. No. Well, no, I mean, really you know how good. to do it. So it, I'm sorry, Jay, go ahead. It's really good. Yep. Okay. Well, then good I, work. I want you, yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. I want your opinion on this too, then. I, I just, my heart sank a little bit 
when Brad did it and then when you posted this the other day because I want to know how this is different than Facebook. How is this going to be different in what we have done? We did this ramp up over a couple of years with Facebook. We got in there. I kind of ra railed against it for a while, and now there's this growing level of frustration. But the, 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 the foundation premise was, wait a second, here's a platform that you're not in control of, that you cannot monetize, and I don't see where this is different. And I would like for you to explain that to me. James. Well, well, first, well, first off, you know, you, you're going to reach everybody that's got you circled up. Now, now, if I'm wrong, you correct me. But mm -hmm. if you put James Spann in a circle, you're going to see it in your feed no matter what. I, I'm not going to be censored to 85% of those people that have me circled. Everybody's going to see that little, you know, blurb about the weather I throw out there. So you, there's uh, no, that's a good point. There's no edge rank is what you're saying. Because right, right. The, 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 the Facebook for you know, now. Algorithm that, yeah, right. for now. Okay, but right. you're saying that it's a, it's a continuous stream that is unfiltered. Right. Did you just and I, and I think gas he, there? Uh, I don't know what that was. I think um <laughs> don't either. I've given I think Kevin Brad gas. Also this is great. <laughs> I think Brad also just suggested you have a better uh, chance of getting people who are not your friends um uh interested in what you have to say. You're more likely to uh, to get some new people interested on Google Plus than you were uh, in Facebook since we're also worried about getting somebody to friend us and then watch us and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and he made the case for it's uh, Google Plus is a more effective way to get people uh, interested in what you have to say. And, and I have reason to believe that Google will provide ways of monetizing that. Not in the way that we like, but <laughs> you know they, they, they have done that with YouTube. You know, a lot of people, this guy, the Gangnam Style guy, Cy, how much money do you think he's making off that YouTube video? Uh, uh, Leo said it. It was on uh, This Week in Tech. He, somewhere there was a number. I want to say it was like $1.8 million or something like that. Right. But, but that is an example of YouTube or, or Google giving you the chance to monetize your material. Mm. And I just so is this a belief or is this that you have or a hope or you have some sort of inside, inside information? Well, I've heard rumblings. Well, come on, tell us. <laughs> well, I've just, I've just heard rumblings, uh, you know, and, and, and they have been, they have re the other thing, they're, they're reaching out to us and I think they're sincere. You know, a lot of us have gone on their hangouts. Uh, I don't know if you guys have done one that, that Google originates about science and weather and, and you know, right. Sure, they're trying to build this thing up, but, uh, you know, I, I just believe it's a better platform now. Will it be in five years? I don't know. But And, and I do agree, too, that there's a lot of people over there that hate Facebook, that <laughs> hate Twitter. Uh, I'm reaching some people over there that I would never, ever, ever, ever reach anywhere else. And I think the community thing they just opened up is also a good thing. So, hmm. you know, for, for me, I, I'm there. I, I believe I it, in the platform, and I'm going to keep pushing it. I think it reinforces the need for stations, for people, for departments to have an overarching social media strategy and differentiate that strategy from the tactics that they use on a given site. What works for Twitter is not going to work for Google+. Plus. What works for Facebook isn't going to work on Pinterest. The overall strategy is the same, but how you execute that strategy for a particular platform is different. And it may be that that strategy, you know, Facebook just doesn't allow you to do some of the things that you want to do with your strategy, so you don't force it. Whereas Twitter and Google Plus may, may be more flexible in that way. So, Well, I, I wanted to open up a little discussion about it, and I appreciate that. One of my continuing problems with this, and I've written about this a little bit recently on the Digital Meteorologist blog, and, and this is going to be a long, hard push to understand this, but it's the difference between pushing and pulling data or having a user push and pull data for you and I would I would reference digitalmeteorologist.com I don't know the exact name of the post it's come come fairly recently but the putting a piece of data into a stream or a river of data is very very different than training somebody or having somebody or asking somebody to come to you when they need the data. Now again, I'm not saying, and please don't tell me I'm anti-social <laughs> media and I'm talking to you guys. I'm not saying you're not supposed to be there. There's a lot of people there. I get it. 
But that, that woman at the thing who said, well, when I heard there were tornadoes, I started looking on Twitter, echoes in my ear every day. Mm -hmm. And there's a very, very important difference. And I think we're responsible for training people in this way. And I think we've trained them into the social, many of them, into this social media thing. And I don't think it's the most effective way. And I think we serve them better by giving them an opportunity to know where to go and how to go when they want to request a piece of information rather than pushing information at them because it's only going to be, it's only a matter of time before the SEO people move into Google Plus as well as they've done with Facebook and Twitter as well search search engine optimization back into the early days that is black magic and people who practice it are quite frankly just useless and evil but it is it is effective, <laughs> unfortunately, and they do it. And I know people personally that have done that. And I just disagree with it as a business model. They're allowed to do it, but eventually those masses are going to show up in, in all these. Pla if you if you open it up to everybody, everybody's going to come, and that's going to create a problem. But uh, all right, again, well, digital meteorology. All right. Well, now that we've got Kevin Good and Frankie. Uh, we got to wrap this thing up because I have to walk across the hall and do some television. Uh, hey, uh, uh, Jay, uh, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, JayTrobeck.com. There you go. Uh, and uh, let's see, Bob, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, best way is DrostRob, so D R O S T R O B at M S U dot E D U. And where's go. Bob's and information? Where's where's some, can we see some of the study data yet online, Bob? Um, some of it we do. Our our lab does have a website, and we put our published papers on there. Um, and actually, if you Google me, there's some stuff that's been published that comes up as well. But if there is anything uh, more specific that anybody's interested in, you give me a call, and I'd be more than happy to forward it to you. Google me, baby. Yeah, yeah. baby. Yeah, it's, it's Bob Dross, D R O S T. Uh, for the regulars here, our uh, email address is email at weatherbrains.com. Our social media accounts are up on the website. All of the pics of the week and the links we talk about are there as well. Which, by uh, the we, way, James, are we ever yes. going to put our Google Plus profiles on the WeatherBrains homepage? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're we're we're, we're going to over the Christmas break. We're going to do some uh, fixing up here. We might we might do a new theme and revamp that website. I, I think we designed that website in 1997, so uh, uh, it's about time for an upgrade. But uh, anyway, uh, it's like time for the news. Again, it's email at weatherbrains.com. We record these shows typically Monday nights at uh, 8.30 Central, 9.30 Eastern, but a special programming note. Christmas week, we are not going to be on Monday night next week. We're doing it Thursday night of this week at 8 Central, 9 Eastern. Thursday night is going to be a really special show. Uh, I can't disclose all the facts here, but it's going to be our Christmas special. So Thursday night, if you want to watch it, it's live.bigbrainsmedia.com. And, of course, you can watch the uh, video replay as well. So on behalf of the entire Weather Brains crew, I'm James Spann. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful week, and God bless. <laughs>《What special stuff? That was a lousy tease. What special stuff on Thursday? Uh, well, uh, a you lot got of the access to the calendar. Be, Go look at will, it. Will, oh, is it on there? They will be. They will be here with me. A lot of the special participants uh, okay. here in the studio. Like we're gonna have, we're gonna have a nice little set, and we're gonna try and make it look. I didn't nice realize. I, I didn't realize you were flying me in Birmingham, James. I appreciate <laughs> well, that. Well, you know, uh, we, we Heck, got you, you up didn't in, even in the invite roach me, and I live here. <laughs> 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 All right, my newscast is on. Bye. Bye.